is breaking news. I'm Mike Montecalvo, Governor Raimondo, giving her daily briefing on the coronavirus. Let's go live now to the State House. Daily press conferences. I hope they provide you with uh, a break in the day and a trusted source of information as we all go through this together. Um, I will say it's, this is getting tough. That staying home, not being in school, it's getting really old for all of us. And I'm asking you to hang in there with me just a little bit longer. It's still a critical time these next couple of weeks. And uh, just, I know, it's, I know it's brutal. But I will tell you, I have spent the last 24 hours m meeting after meeting focused nearly exclusively on how do we safely get folks back to work, child care centers open, et cetera. So I don't have an answer, and it's not going to happen in a week or two weeks, but I want you to know I have my eye on that prize and making sure we can do it safely. And in the meantime, hang in there a little bit longer, but just know that I'm right there with you and know that this is getting harder, not easier. Um, but we can do it. We can do it. And if we stay, hang tough together, we'll all be safer and better for it. Uh, tomorrow, by the way, we will be back to the 1 o'clock time. I'm sorry we had to switch to 2.30 today. But tomorrow we will be back at the regular 1 o'clock hour and continue with 1 o'clock from there on. So I want to begin um, today with a little bit of a change uh, in how I'll be giving these briefings. Uh, in, usually I begin every day with just the facts, the number of people in the hospital, number of people who have contracted the virus, etc. Uh, you will see today on the screen a new dashboard that my team has created. And from today going forward, in every one of these press events, we will have that dashboard on the screen. It will be updated daily so that you can see the information uh, that we have as it relates to coronavirus. Um, I have to say, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to the folks on my team who have made this possible. It might look simple. It's just a simple snapshot of all the data. There's a ton of work that went into that. I am so proud of you all for um, making this possible. From day one, I have said I wanted to be transparent and fact-based. I want to give you, the people of Rhode Island, the facts that you need and deserve to live your lives safely. And so this is just another step in our effort to make the information that much better, uh, more accessible, and more granular for everybody to see. The, the snapshot is just the basic data. If you go to the uh, Department of Health's website under the section of data, you'll see a little bit more. So there's a breakdown there by city, you know, cases by city. There's a little bit more information if you're interested for a little bit more information. Um, so again, uh, thank you so much to everybody on the team who worked so hard to make that possible. And I hope Rhode Islanders uh, will, will feel we feel a little relief when you look at that. I mean, the numbers are going up, uh, and that's not a great feeling. But on the other hand, it's there. It's the facts. And from the beginning, we've said facts, not frenzy. And so I'm trying to do our part to make sure you have those good facts. Uh, I wanted to take a minute today to provide an update on our, our work stream around quarantine and isolation. So uh, yesterday, I, I have gave a little bit of an update on testing. And each day, I want to give you a view into the work that we're doing. Why is quarantine and isolation so important? Because when we get to a point where people start to go to work, kids start to go to school, the way we're going to be able to do that safely is if we can quickly identify who's sick or who has been exposed to someone who's sick and then quickly get them into quarantine, or if they are sick, isolate them. That's the name of the game, to have a m more pinpointed, um, uh, focused way instead of what we're doing now, which is this blunt instrument of you know, closing all restaurants and having social distancing, which is something we can't maintain. The group that runs the, we call it QI, Quarantine and Isolation Workstream, 
is the fabulous Rose Jones. Rose is our director of Office of Healthy Aging. She has a team of a few dozen people reporting to her. And her job is to make sure that we have enough quarantine and isolation facilities and rooms and that everybody who's in quarantine and isolation is properly supported so that they can adhere to the requirement of staying home, which is not easy, not easy. Someone has to do your grocery shopping, go to the pharmacy, um, check in on you, track your symptoms, etc. So over the last six weeks, Rose and her team of about 60 people, which is a cross-sector team, it's people from the health department, our office of planning, housing advocates, National Guard, tech team, and more, they've built an entire system from scratch. We had none of this a few weeks ago. Uh, at this point, we have more than 6,000 Rhode Islanders in quarantine, the vast, vast majority, nearly all of whom are safely in their homes. Um, and as a quick reminder, quarantine means staying home. It's a fancy word for don't leave your house, not even to get groceries. Um, in order to help those people in quarantine, we've developed the capability to deliver tens of thousands of meals per day and also deliver um, thousands of grocery deliveries per day. Again, a few weeks ago, we had none of this capacity. So over the last month, Meals on Wheels made 32,000 home deliveries, while our senior centers and schools are also distributing 22,000 meals every day. When I made the tough decision to close schools, I knew that for most kids, a lot of kids, the only way they're going to get a meal or two a day is at school. And we committed ourselves then to making sure we would get this nutritious food to children, and by and large, we've done that. By the way, thank you to Meals on Wheels, thank you to the mayors, thank you to senior centers, thank you to all of our municipal leaders. Um, we are the mission control, my team and I are the mission control, but we have so many partners on the ground, and as it relates to food delivery, huge shout out to municipal leaders, because you've been terrific partners. Um, this week, the numbers continue to grow. You know, tens of thousands is gonna go up. So I'm happy, pleased to announce that um, now the URI Dining Services is launching a partnership with senior centers delivering healthy dinners to our older neighbors all around the state. So big thank you to URI for being a partner and doing your part to help us through, this, through these difficult times. Now, uh, again, as I've said, when we, you know, the coronavirus is tough on everybody. Unfortunately, it's toughest on those who are already vulnerable. If before coronavirus you were living in poverty, you were housing insecure, you were, had a difficult domestic situation, this has only made it that much worse. And it is my commitment to do everything I can do every day to make sure that nobody gets left behind. Now, I will be the first to say we are far from perfect, far, far, far from perfect. We get a little bit better every day, but man, we have a long way to go. And there's lots of people out there who are really struggling, you know, still homeless, still struggling. K kids who are still having a hard time with access to Wi-Fi. But I'll tell you this, we're gonna fight every day to reach every last one of you. And literally every day we're getting a f more of you. More kids today have access to Wi-Fi than yesterday, literally. More home, people who are homeless struggling with the virus, we're reaching them more today than yesterday, and we're gonna stay at it. So to that end, for those people who don't have a safe home in which to quarantine, we've contracted with the Wyndham Hotel in Warwick. It currently has uh, just over 200 beds reserved for people who are homeless or housing insecure. And we've served about 50 people already at that location. Um, so again, if you're homeless or housing insecure, uh, or you just lost your job and become homeless, we still want to keep you safe. And so we have, we have arranged for this hotel so that we can keep you there safely in quarantine. I also know that being in quarantine can be incredibly lonely. You know, sitting at home or in a hotel alone for weeks on end 
And, and this is particularly so for older Rhode Islanders. So the working group that Rose runs in collaboration with community partners has developed programs in which people can check in on one another every day with a daily phone call or a daily Zoom call. Uh, we have well over 100 volunteers already signed up to check in daily on our older neighbors through Project Hello. So that's incredible. Like just, I know this is hard, and, and as I say, everything I roll out is imperfect. Three weeks ago, we had no infrastructure for quarantining and isolation. Now we've commandeered a hotel, we have 6,000 people in quarantining, we're delivering 50,000 meals a day, and we have Project Hello with over 100 volunteers checking in on our seniors to make sure that they don't get lonely while they're in quarantine. So to the team who's been making this happen, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and to everyone in Rhode Island, know that we're gonna stay at it. Uh, having said that, I wanna give you a preview of what is to come, because we are gonna keep working 24 seven to make this support more robust. We are working on robust delivery and concierge service to ensure everyone has the food and supplies that they need. So I've recently reached out to Uber and Lyft to see if we could do a partnership with them to enhance our ability to deliver groceries and food. I know we're not meeting the demand, so we're gonna do more. We're working with our colleges and universities to discuss the possibility of using some of their dormitories to provide uh, free housing to people who need it um, while they're in quarantine. You know, for example, if you're a frontline worker, if you're a healthcare worker, uh, and healthcare workers are tr tr truly bearing the brunt of this, or a first responder, you might not want to go home at night because you don't want to. Um, expose those living in your home to the virus. So we're looking into using dormitories as a safe place for you to live uh, without cost to help you get through the, to help you get through the stretch. We're also working on a one-stop app, a phone app or computer app that allows real-time tracking and monitoring of symptoms so that when you're home, if you're sick, you can have a, a constant check-in on your health condition. Uh, all of this is necessary to take care of Rhode Island, but also I have to have it all in place at scale before I can, before I can reopen the economy. So that to give you a view of how we're thinking about it. I also want to um, make an announcement today that something we've been working very hard on is the launch of a new initiative called rihavens.com. It's a new website that connects those in need of a safe space to quarantine with hotel rooms across the state, hotel rooms offered at significantly reduced prices. Uh, if you go on to rihavens.com, you will find um, very affordable options as low as $25 a night. And this is part of the broader effort that I'm describing. If you are a frontline healthcare worker, if for whatever, your first responder, whatever reason, you, you know, don't feel it's safe to live in your house, you don't want to expose others in your home to what you've been exposed to, you can go to rihavens.com starting today. And there's a variety of options there for hotels, a variety of price ranges, starting at $25 an hour. Soon, I hope to have more options there which will be free in the dormitories that I was just describing. I wanna give a huge shout out to the Rhode Island Hospitality Association and all of the local hotel owners and operators. You guys have been terrific in partnering with us and helping us to help Rhode Islanders stay safe. So um, my priority is to make, to make sure we're all safe. And again, once we get to the business of letting more people go back to work, we just, we need to have more of these quarantine and isolation services up and running. And so that's our goal. But my, I've heard from a lot of you, I especially hear from healthcare workers, 
I think it's unbelievable what you're doing, fighting the fight every day. And the least we can do is make sure that you have a safe place to go home at night and keep yourself safe or quarantine and isolate if you need to. So I hope some of this gives you some sense of relief. And again, I hope that by this time next week, I have even, have even more options to share. Uh, speaking of frontline healthcare workers, I, I would like to take a second, um, would like to take a second to talk about PPE, personal protective equipment. Yesterday I was asked a question by a reporter, you know, uh, the question was, are the hospitals all set? Do they have enough PPE um, that they need? And what I said is that essentially they do for now. You know, they're, they're getting through, they're getting by a day at a time, a week at a time. We're not in a position, which is where I'd like to be, where they would have several weeks of PPE on hand and where they would have clear visibility into um, how much they could procure. As a result, many of these hospitals are having to make really tough decisions. And that means if you're a doctor, if you're a nurse, if you're working in an ER, if you're a CNA, if you're a social worker, uh, if you're a behavioral health care worker, you're living under really tough conditions. You're having to reuse your PPE, maybe reuse it to a point that you don't feel comfortable. You're having to have your PPE used and um, cleaned and reused. You're having to put it in a paper bag. Let me be crystal clear. I, that is not satisfactory. That is not what we're trying to achieve. That's where we are today. And, and I, I, just today, in fact, I had a phone call with the person, Steve King, who's managing the state's PPE inventory. We're getting more masks. We are struggling to get gowns. That's a difficult thing right now for whatever reason. We are placed a huge order for surgical masks. We are trying to get our hands on as many N95s as we can. It is a fight. It is continually a global daily fight out there. And uh, we're out there and we're doing it. Um, so, you know, are we managing? Yes. Are we getting by day to day? Yes. Is it the crisis that it was a couple of weeks ago? No. But do I think that if you're a doctor or a nurse or a CNA, that you're all set and things are, are great? Absolutely not. And I want you to know, I value your courage and your bravery, and thank God we have you, and know that we get up every day to do better. And we will continue to do better. Um, we're getting the Battelle system soon, which allows us to sanitize masks at um, tens of thousands at a time. We're getting more orders in. So we're gonna get you there. Hang in there, continue to be brave, keep saving Rhode Islanders lives, and stay in touch with us and the Department of Health so that we never get you into a situation which is, which is back to that crisis. I neglected to mention something on the uh, quarantine and isolation, so I'd like to go back to it. Yesterday or the day before, there was a question around, what if you live on a border town to Massachusetts and want to go grocery shopping? Um, so, you know, Barrington, Tiverton, lots of folks in the East Bay live right on the border. It's frankly easier and quicker to go to Seekonk to do your grocery shopping. The question was, I think, do we have to be in quarantine? So, look, l let me tell you what I think about that. I need you to be smart about it. If you live five minutes away from the stop and shop in Seekonk, and it's a half an hour for you to get to the next stop and shop, well, then go to the stop and shop in Seekonk. However, when you come home, stay in your house. You know, remember, everybody's under the stay at home order until May 8th. So, all I can tell you is, and I can tell everybody out there, the less you leave your house, the safer we'll all be. In a fantasy world, which is not um, possible, if we all stayed in our house for a few weeks, we could probably get this thing down to zero infection rate. We can't do that, I'm not suggesting that. My point is, just use some good judgment. 
You know, I don't want you driving 30, 40 minutes to do your grocery shopping. But if you have to go to Seekonk, Attleboro, if that's the best, safest option in your judgment, go ahead and do that. Come home and stay home. Wear your mask when you're out. Wash your hands constantly. Go alone. Don't bring your whole family. Stay away from people in the grocery store. And don't go out if you're sick. So all of these measures that we're offering um, are intended to keep you safe and keep your neighbors safe and frankly to make it so we can all get back to work more quickly. So I, I wanted to address that and I hope it helps. Uh, back to um, healthcare workers, I want to, we're working very, very, very hard to make it so that our frontline healthcare workers can get tested more quickly. And right now we were focused on all healthcare workers, but most particularly um, those folks in nursing homes and in, and, and in other congregate care settings. So if you're a nurse or a physician or a CNA and you are working in a nursing home, in a group home, in another congregate setting, we are very, very focused on making sure that you can all be tested immediately without delay um, and get your results quickly. And I expect to have more announcements around this um, today, tomorrow, and the next day. The announcement for today is that I want you to know we've set up a fast track testing um, system available for all of our nursing home healthcare workers through the CVS site at Twin River. So we spoke yesterday with CVS. CVS is phenomenal. I cannot say enough good things about the corporate partner that CVS has been. They're going to give us uh, a couple hundred um, spots every day just for um, frontline healthcare workers in congregate settings. So you, don't, you won't need an appointment. These will go quickly. You'll get your result right away. Um, so nursing homes, if you're, if you're a nurse and you're hearing me say this, you want to know how you get it, talk to your boss at the nursing home. The Department of Health is in touch with all the nursing homes and they're making arrangements for uh, everybody to get this test as necessary. We're going to continue to roll out other um, fast track ways for all other healthcare workers in the coming days. Uh, and one other point is actually ending on kind of a sweet note and a uh, uh, happy note. Obviously, uh, having to be home uh, is very difficult. But maybe even more, certainly even more difficult is we now have a lot of people who are sick, sick in the hospital, sick in isolation, and it's incredibly difficult because their family members can't visit them. It's, it's devastating, really, if someone you love, your husband, your wife, your mother, is in a hospital or in a setting and they're sick and they're suffering and you can't be with them. So we've been trying to figure out how can we ease that pain a little bit so that people in isolation, in hospitals, you know, have some human contact with those that they love. And we've, um, you know, been putting out the word that we want some help with this. So a 19-year-old uh, Providence resident, Kaya Sooner, heard us talking about this issue and immediately looked for a way to help. He partnered with the Rhode Island Medical Society to create an initiative called COVID Connectors. And it's a program that allows anyone to donate iPads, iPhones, and laptops to Rhode Island hospitals. And today, I'm very proud to say that Amazon has generously agreed to donate 540 tablets to support this effort. So this is a fantastic thing. Uh, I would ask you if you have an old iPad or a tablet or a phone and you are in a position to be able to donate it, please go to covidconnectors.org, covidconnectors.org. You can turn in your device. They'll um, make sure to wipe it clean or even better, you could do that before you submit it. And then that will be um, available to somebody in a hospital 
are in a, a nursing home or congregate care setting so that they can stay in touch with their loved ones. Uh, we've done it. My son Tommy has given away uh, one of his iPads because he wanted to do his part. I'm proud of that. And if you can, I would urge you to do it because it's not only our physical health, but it's our mental and emotional health. And now's the time to uh, pitch in and be there for your loved ones. So Kaya, you're 19, but you're a superstar and you're a hero and thanks for stepping up. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Nicole. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. We're certainly very pleased about the data dashboard that the governor described. There are armies of people at the Rhode Island Department of Health and throughout state government who have been on the team doing an enormous amount of work behind the scenes to get numbers to you every day. I know that's what allows me to say with confidence the numbers that are extremely vast in what's being collected in a very quick amount of time, uh, that there is a super strong data team working hard to make sure those numbers are as close to accurate as possible. I want to really take a moment to acknowledge them and thank them publicly. They know who they are. As is visible on the dashboard, we have 278 new cases and seven new fatalities, unfortunately, to report. Four of these fatalities were people in their 80s, two were people in their 90s, and one of them was older than 100. These are people that are loved by families and we extend our condolences to them. Of these seven individuals, six were nursing home residents. As the governor and I have discussed, nursing homes and other congregate care settings remain very challenging for us in Rhode Island and a top priority to help address. They are also challenging environments for states across the country. We have a number of interventions in place and in the works to continue to focus on preventing transmission in nursing homes and other congregate settings and to make sure that people get the specialized care that they need in these settings. We have core infection control measures that we are very aggressive with. We have testing strategies, some of which the governor mentioned, many others that are also occurring in these settings as we continue to engage with nursing homes and other congregate settings. We have cohorting strategies to be able to safely care for COVID positive patients while caring separately for the COVID negative patients and helping the staff be able to care for those individual cohorts or groups of people in ways that make it so that there is not an exchange. And as I've mentioned before, to also be able to limit the different types of people that interact uh, with the residents so that we can support individuals, we can support uh, nursing home facilities to have one individual who's able to perform a number of tasks while engaging uh, with that resident. So we'll continue to share updates with you all as we continue to apply thoughtful, aggressive measures that are needed, knowing the priority that our nursing home and all of our congregate setting environments are for us and for Rhode Islanders overall. Separately, I wanna take a moment to discuss the cloth face coverings. Yesterday, the governor announced an executive order about cloth face coverings. That executive order states that all employees of customer facing businesses office-based businesses, manufacturers, and nonprofits must wear cloth face coverings when they're at work. I want to clarify and emphasize that we are talking about cloth face coverings, similar to what the governor shared yesterday and what I showed, we've made creatively, thanks to my husband. We are not talking about medical masks like N95 or surgical masks, which are what healthcare workers are using in their specialized settings. We are talking about cloths. That could mean a scarf, a bandana, or something improvised 
from home, whether it be a t-shirt or another piece of cloth. Our goal is to limit or prevent the spread of respiratory droplets when people are in the community and in public. So you wearing that helps protect the people who are around you. It is important to wash your cloth face covering frequently, ideally after each use and at a minimum, at least daily. And like yesterday, I want to reiterate that these cloth face coverings are not replacements for the other measures that we have been talking about that are critical, like not being in groups, washing your hands throughout the day, and absolutely staying home if you are sick. That's the primary way that this virus is transmitted through symptoms from one person to the next. If you stay home, that is how we can stop the viral transmission from occurring. We are also saying that because there are times as we're learning with this virus that someone may feel well be without symptoms, and still be at risk of transmitting illness. Stay-at-home order is in place specifically to address that, absolutely for people who are ill, but even if you're not, you should be working from home as much as you can. If you need to go out, it's only for those critical needs. To work and back and staying home. The cloth face covering makes it so that even if you are feeling well and there's risk that you may have uh, transmission of illness that you're not aware of, wearing a cloth face covering will help to limit that. We've heard that some people are having a little trouble making cloth face coverings at home, particularly people who may not have access to the internet. If you are not sure how to make a cloth face covering, you can call our COVID-19 hotline that number we've been sharing is 401-222-8022. There are many creative ways, similar to what I showed yesterday, and many others to be able to make a cloth face covering that you can use. It's really just about being able to cover your nose and your mouth. Call us at our COVID-19 hotline, 401-222-8022. We're here for you, we are a resource for you, and don't be afraid to reach out for anything if you need help, whether it's this or what the governor mentioned earlier today. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to the governor for questions. Thank you. And thank you for the clarification about the East Bay residents heading to Seacon. Yeah. Yeah. Now I will say, I, of course, would like everybody to support the local economy. So if everyone's spending their money, I would prefer you spend it in Rhode Island. Having said that, I understand the issue and I, hopefully I clarified it. Okay. We begin today with Steve Alquist from Uprise RI. Thoughts, prayer, action. A gun safety youth group is asking that you close gun stores and declare them non-essential in response to what they call an alarming increase in gun sales. Yeah. Your thoughts? So it's a great group and I appreciate the question. Uh, I have decided and, and most likely will continue to decide to keep them open, though I'll take a look at what you send. Um, there has been a spike in gun sales and that is exactly why I've signed an executive order to extend the amount of time that public safety officers can have to complete the background check. So I want, it, it used to be seven days and we've expanded that. So I want Rhode Islanders to feel secure that these background checks are happening and we're giving police and the state police the time they need to, to conduct the background checks. Next question is from Michael Bilo of Motif Magazine. Hero pay is proposed for nurses, teachers, and essential workers, but college adjunct faculty are treated as gig workers. State colleges could see skyrocketing demand with unemployment, financial pressure on students, and CCRI Rhode Island promise. Is there a plan for this? Yeah, so it's a great question. By the way, I am a supporter of increasing the pay of uh, frontline healthcare workers and essential, you know, um, uh, public safety uh, as we go through this crisis for a period of time. Um, I, am, I am advocating, I think the right way to do that is from the federal government and I'm working hard to make that happen. Uh, 
having said that, you put forth an excellent point, and that we don't have a solution yet, partially because you have to be careful for unintended consequences, you have to make sure you have the funds to be able to do it. So we are, we are working to see what we might be able to do here at the state our, our funds would only allow us to do something on a very targeted basis, uh, very targeted, and to make sure that, frankly, we have enough health care workers on the front line, particularly in nursing homes and hospitals as we get through this. It is my hope, and uh, I'm working with the federal delegation to see if the federal government could have a more expansive approach in the next round of COVID stimulus. Brian Crandall of NBC10 says, Governor, why not order everyone out in public to wear face coverings, not just workers like Governor Cuomo is now doing in New York? Yeah, you know, I think everyone should do that. Uh, we have said that's what everyone should be doing. As I said yesterday, that's what I do. My husband and I went for a walk yesterday after work. We had our face coverings. That's what people should be doing. Uh, and anecdotally, as I walk around, that's what people are doing. I think some people are still struggling with it. It feels weird. Like Nicole said, they don't know where to get a mask. But I would strongly encourage every single Rhode Islander um, at all times when you are out and about to wear your cloth face covering. John DePietro says that one of his radio listeners, Maria, is a cashier at a popular store in Rhode Island. Her manager told the cashiers they must apply their own face coverings and hand sanitizer since the store would not provide it. The workers feel this is unfair. Yeah, it is unfair, and it also violates the executive order that I signed yesterday. So why don't you call me later and tell me what employer that is, and we'll take care of it. The next question is from Tanya Signori of the RI Echo. Loans are a good thing, however, some small businesses may need more of a constant cash flow. Can a system be set up in Rhode Island in the grocery and the retail stores where at the end of a customer's transaction, it is asked if a customer wants to donate $1 to the Rhode Island SBA? You know, that's a, that's a really sweet gesture and I will look into it. The reality is the need is unbelievable now. I put out a new loan program on I think it was Tuesday, it was $10 million. By the way, they're forgivable loans, so chances are you won't have to pay them back if you make certain criteria. And within three hours, it was depleted. So uh, thank you for your, that's a kind thought and we'll, we will look at it. In the meantime, I'm also hard at work trying to find other large sources of funding to give a lifeline to our small businesses. Ryan Belmore of What's Up Newport asks a similar question. Can you provide an update on any type of hazards pay or any kind of additional support that's coming for Rhode Island's essential frontline or customer-facing workers? Is that something you can do or does it need to come from the yeah. federal government? So I, I think I answered that. But, you know, the state is under extreme budgetary uh, limitations at the moment. Uh, extreme. Obviously, our COVID-related expenses are skyrocketing, our revenue is plummeting. And to do this right, and by right, I mean kind of broadly across the economy for all healthcare workers, I think it's best done from the federal government. The federal government, with the pandemic unemployment assistance, um, has expanded UI benefits, and they've also given an extra $600 for folks who are on UI. I think they should do a similar thing to uh, all of our healthcare workers who are out there. So we're working that. In the meantime, I am also working with my team to see if there's some like smaller targeted initiative where we can provide some more immediate relief to the folks who need it most. Bill Bartholomew says that he was at a shop yesterday that is deemed essential but refused to accept cash. Can you clarify Rhode Island's laws with respect to requirement to accept cash? Bill, you have stumped me, and I will have to get back to you on that. We have not relaxed that requirement, so it should still be in full force and effect. Um, but I will look, I'll look into it further. Our next question is from Ben DeCastro, social media influencer. The ratio of negative versus positive results since closing state parks 12 days ago is similar for the 10 days prior to the closure. Would you consider reopening the parks this weekend with the social distancing and cloth covering as a way to reduce foot traffic and the rise in pedestrian versus bike and car access? Yeah. So. Um I think people should be going for a walk. 
And if you, as I have said, if, if you're lucky enough to live near a beach or a state park, go for a walk. It's a great way to get out and about. Uh, the mayor of Providence has taken a different approach here in Providence. Um, but I think, you know, we have closed our um, parking lots because we found that when we had the parking lots open at beaches and state parks, people were just congregating. So it wasn't one or two or three people walking. It wasn't just a family walking together. They were big groups of people. And by the way, with the weather getting nicer, I, I think if I were to take your advice, it would be create a bigger problem this weekend. So my approach is let's get through these next two weeks. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be safe. And then I hope I'll be able to start to think about some of the things you're talking about, which is relaxing a little bit so we can slowly and in a safe way get back to some semblance of normalcy. The next question is from Tara Granahan. Representative Anastasia Williams tells us she's urged you to issue an executive order, which she drafted, stating any COVID-19 infection suffered by a frontline worker or essential personnel shall be considered work-related, providing the worker with labor protections. She hasn't heard from you. I haven't seen it, but I will certainly look at it. As a reminder, uh, everyone now has a minimum of 10 days of paid sick leave. We also have uh, one of the first emergency orders I did, executive orders, was to expand TDI to create a COVID TDI benefit. Uh, and then now there is the pandemic uh, assistance fund, which provides UI benefits plus $600 to people in exactly that circumstance. So I will always, of course, listen to a good idea from anyone. And I will look at it, but right now there are three new buckets of benefits for exactly that sort of worker. So I just want to make sure everyone knows about that. Matt Allen has a question in regard to the dashboard that was just released. Looking at the new data on the portal just released, it looks like the beginning of a downward curve in positive tests. Is that what the DOH data is telling you? When will the public get to see the projections you're working yeah, with? Yeah, th thank you, Matt. So um, tomorrow I plan to uh, share some of the data that we have around our modeling. I have been reluctant to do that. Frankly, I'm still a little reluctant to do that because we still have so little data. But uh, so the, answer, the short answer is tomorrow, we are not in a downward slope. That I can assure you. Uh, I do think because of the great work of Rhode Islanders, we have uh, been successful in reducing the, um, the, the, how high the slope is and how much we're climbing up the ramp. Um, so it's, as we've been saying, we are beginning to flatten the curve, but we're definitely not on the downswing. Our next question comes from Tim White at WPRI. Viewers are writing in wondering if face shields are an acceptable alternative to face masks if people can't get their hands on a mask. It's an interesting uh, question. When healthcare workers are uh, using it in certain situations, they have both a mask as well as a face shield for the goggles uh, component. In, for the public, members of the public, the key is to be able to cover the nose and the mouth. So if it's a face shield that happens to be able to allow for that so that the infectious particles that are emitted when we speak or laugh or cough uh, do not project out onto anything, then that's a creative uh, way to achieve uh, the same goal. Uh, but for most people, the easiest option to actually create something from a cloth that you already have is to use the cloth face coverings that we have been referencing. Thank you. The next question from Amanda Pitts. Uh, this is very similar to what the governor has already spoken about, crossing the border into the Massachusetts grocery stores. Can we skip to the next one? 
are nursing home staff who test positive for COVID-19 but are asymptomatic or who have mild symptoms allowed to continue to work or do they have to self-quarantine? This is from Lynn Arditi. It's an excellent question. It's all of what we are grappling with to um, be able to make sure that patients and residents are best cared for while maintaining the workforce staff. Our primary message and focus is if someone has symptoms and they are a healthcare worker, they absolutely need to stay home. That's the um, definitive message that is in place. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have released guidelines that help us understand creative ways to address the situation, particularly if staffing is short. If you have someone who does not have symptoms, who is wearing an appropriate mask while at work, even if they have tested uh, positive for COVID, as long as they've gone at least seven days without developing any symptoms, um, we are assessing the potential for allowing them to be able to work safely in caring for other patients who are already COVID positive. That's an example of one of the many measures that we are taking to provide the support that's needed in our nursing home and other congregate settings, but doing it in the safest um, way possible with the evidence that supports it. Amanda Milkovitz of the Boston Globe is asking, when will all hospitals, nursing homes, and home health care have the PPE and medical equipment needed for the surge? Did Rhode Island lose most of the federal stockpile to New York? As the governor has shared, a ton of work has been going on scouring the globe to make sure that we have the personal protective equipment that is needed, particularly for our healthcare workforce. These are the heroes who are on the front line, who we know need to be protected in the way that uh, they uh, should be while caring for patients and residents in um, all of our healthcare facilities. So every effort is being done to make sure that we have the PPE needed to bring us through the surge. And that's oftentimes where you hear the governor saying we might be okay for today, but it's also having enough to get us through uh, the next several weeks. And I really want to credit uh, the leaders on our PPE uh, team uh, that has worked extremely hard to get us to the point to be able to um, face um, what's before us in needing to have the adequate PPE needed. Um, we don't have the understanding that uh, the PPE we had went elsewhere. We know that states across the country um, are also looking for uh, PPE, New York, Massachusetts, and other, other states as well. So, but you can be assured that we have a very strong team here who's um, making sure that Rhode Island is where they need to be, where we need to be to protect our healthcare workers and others that need PPE. Nancy Thomas of RI News Today asks, will employees ask customers who are not wearing masks to leave the business? Thank you for the question. Uh, they shouldn't. In fact, there's a, as DBR is putting forth the regulations, we will make note that um, customers shouldn't be turned away. Having said that, we, I'm asking, customers shouldn't be doing that. Customers should be using a cloth face mask. It could be a sock, it could be a scarf, it could be anything, cloth face mask. And we are asking um, employers and retail operations or any business that's open, grocery stores and the like, to do their very best to advertise the fact, put up signage, et cetera, make sure the customer knows uh, that they should be wearing a face mask. But they, they shouldn't be turning customers away. Governor, our last question for today, and it's a big one. We all wonder what summer in Rhode Island will look like. Do you have a vision of what a rollout of beaches and parks reopening might look like? This is from Elise Major of Providence Monthly. Yeah. I have a dream. I know what I would like to have happen, because I'm a big user of the beaches in the summer. Uh, I don't yet, but I would like to say that we will, we will be able to be using our bar parks and beaches um, somehow this summer. I'll leave it at that. 
we are still going to be under some restrictions this summer. There's no way around that. Um, even if we're going back to work or kids have summer camp, there will still be restrictions all summer long, all fall, frankly, until we have an effective treatment and until we have a vaccine. A treatment will come sooner, I think, than a vaccine, but a vaccine is well more than a year away. There's going to still be restrictions, and those restrictions particularly will be around crowds. There's going to be strict restrictions continually around the size of crowds um, and our ability to congregate. But I'm going to do my very best to make sure we can all go for a swim and go for a walk on the beach and go for a walk in the park somehow this summer um, in a new way, in a way that keeps us safe. Thank you. Thanks. And you've been watching a live news conference from the State House with Governor Gina Raimondo and Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott from the Rhode Island Department of Health. The latest on the coronavirus pandemic in our country and especially in the state. The governor kind of uh, changed things up a little bit. Usually she starts off with the number of new cases. Today she talked about the number of people who were in the hospital. The new number is 229. 54 people are on the ICU. 44 people need ventilators to breathe. And good news here, 168 people have have been discharged. So the new numbers in the state with more testing, you know the numbers are going to go up. We're at 278 new positive cases of coronavirus. That's bringing the total to over 3,500. And sadly, we have seven more people who passed away in the state. Four were in their 80s, two in their 90s, and one person was more than 100 years old. Out of the seven, six were in nursing homes. All of us here at Eyewitness News, we pass along our sympathies to those families who lost loved ones. Some of the good things that are happening that the governor kind of brought up today, Meals on Wheels that do great work throughout the year have delivered 32,000 meals this week, so we want to thank them. Governor is uh, working on a new initiative with the Rhode Island Dining Services and Senior Centers in order to help out and deliver some healthy food to seniors in need. For those who are homeless or uh, housing insecure, they may have lost their jobs and they need a place to stay. The Wyndham Hotel is opening up a uh, uh, multiple rooms for them. Also, she is working with colleges and universities for free housing for those who are first responders, may not want to go home, uh, risk anything to their families. So she's trying to work it out, those who may be in quarantine. So that's a project they're working on right now with colleges and universities. And she gave a shout out to 19-year-old Kaya Sooner. You may have seen Kaya earlier this week on uh, Eyewitness News. We featured Kaya. He is uh, actually looking for tablets. They will wipe them clean, getting those tablets and giving them maybe to loved ones who might might be in nursing homes and hospitals and even seniors that are uh, by themselves so they can see their loved ones. Uh, COVIDConnector.org if you want to know more about it. You can actually go to our website. We have uh, Kay's story on our website, WPRI.com. And that last question you heard, what will the summer look like in the state of Rhode Island? The governor does not know, but she is hopeful we'll be able to use our parks and beaches. Of course, we have more on WPRI.com and the WPRI 12 News app. We have have minute by minute updates on new restrictions and cancellations. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Mike Montecalvo. We'll see you with team coverage and Eyewitness News starting live at 5. Stay with Eyewitness News for the latest on this breaking story.